go ahead and open up your Bibles to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 15. If you don't have a Bible and you need one, go ahead and raise your hand. We'll get a Bible to you. Uh, you definitely want to have a Bible uh, to put your eyes on the scriptures. You want to be able to see God's word with your own eyes. <clears throat> it should be very clear to you as we go through the, the scriptures together that you see that I'm not pulling a rabbit out of a hat, but that you, you, you see exactly what, what I'm trying to, to explain. It seems very clear to you. And so uh, the best way to do that is that you uh, see the scriptures, you look at it. Another way that you can do it, if you have a smartphone or a tablet, is you can open up the YouVersion Bible app. There's an event there, and you can follow along in the events section there as well. Romans chapter 15 is where we find ourselves this morning. It's been said that you can live about 40 days without food. You can live about three days without water. You can live about five minutes without air, but you can't live one second without hope. Hope is a, an absolutely vital, great, great human need. It's one, among the greatest of human needs. And yet it, it's an elusive thing to us, isn't it? The idea of hope, isn't it something of an elusive thing? Uh, it's, it's this thing that we, we sort of, we try to get our hands around. It seems really hard to get. And it seems also really easy to lose. And yet it's this thing that we need so desperately. And I think that our problem with hope, if I was to, to try to boil it all down, our problem with hope is that we tie it to our circumstances. We tend to put our hope in some sort of circumstantial thing, whether it's a physical, mental, or emotional kind of a thing. It's, it's usually something that happens to us, and that's where that hope is placed. We even use the word hope in terms of things like, well, I hope it doesn't snow later, or maybe you're hoping it does snow later. I don't know which side you're on. Uh, we can fight about it later. But uh, there's, there's this hope, or, or like, like right now, one of the big hopes I have is they're building in and out Burger in Colorado. And my hope is placed in the, in the date that they open this place. And I guarantee I'll be in that two mile long line waiting to get a burger. And I'm going after church probably every Sunday. So if you want to find me, that's where I'll be. But my hope is there, right? I have, I have this hope and we sort of tend to place it in circumstantial things, which is why it's so elusive. The truth is that hope is actually a physical, oh, it's not a physical, it's a spiritual issue. Hope is actually a spiritual issue, but the spiritual issue has implications physically, mentally, and emotionally. And so it plays out in our lives in different ways, but it's actually a spiritual issue. It's not a physical, mental, or emotional issue. You know, it's, it's not something that, that happens to us. It's not that if I just had this certain thing, if I just had that house, then my hope would be uh, revealed. It's not if I just had that relationship, I was able to get married or have children, then my hope would be satisfied. Or it's not, you know, I've just got to, I just got to really think uh, good thoughts. If I just have a positive mind, I think good thoughts, then I'll have hope. Or, you know, if I just really get in control of my emotions and I tamp them down so they really aren't there, there's no emotions, uh, then, then maybe I'll have hope. And we tend to put it in all these things, but really it's a spiritual issue. You see, we can't work ourselves into hope. We can't think ourselves into hope. We can't feel ourselves into hope. It's vital for us to understand what hope is and how it all comes together, especially in today's climate. In 2020, here in November of 2020, this is a weird year. And if there's anything that we can look back across this year and look at, it's that what's being worn down on us is hope. That's the idea that our hope is being worn down. And we see it in all sorts of things. Suicide rates are on the rise. They're 200% higher than typical. Drug abuse, alcohol abuse, um, uh, just you know, uh, uh, substance abuse, all that kind of stuff. Um, people in interrelational abuse, it's all on the rise. It's, it is a very trying time. And so it's important for us to grasp the idea of hope. And that's exactly what uh, Romans chapter 15 is targeting for us together today. So here's our big idea as we look at Romans 15, 1 through 13. It's this, when the character of God is developed in the people of God through the word of God, it produces the hope of God. 
That's, that's what Romans 15 is targeting for us. It's all about how do we actually get hope. And the thing is, is that it's tied to God's word and tied to God's character. It's not this thing that we will ourselves into or just create on our own or just try really hard and grasp. It's, it's, the truth of it is that it's actually something that God puts in you. It's something that God produces within you by his spirit. So Romans 15, let's read the, the whole section together, 1 through 13, and then we'll go back through and break it down. It says this, Romans 15, 1. We then, who are strong, ought to bear with the scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let, us each, uh, let each of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we, through the patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. Now, May the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another according to Christ Jesus that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore receive one another just as Christ also received us to the glory of God. Now I say that Jesus Christ has become a servant to the circumcision for the truth of God uh, to confirm the promises made to the fathers and that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, for this reason I will confess to you, uh, confess you among, co confess you, uh, confess to you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. And again he says, verse 10, rejoice O Gentiles with his people and again, praise the Lord all you Gentiles, laud him all you peoples. And again Isaiah says, there shall be a root of Jesse and he who shall rise to reign over the Gentiles in him the Gentiles shall hope. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy, peace, and believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to open your word. We thank you for how good you are. God, we thank you for your timing. That your word, as we go through it, as we fix our eyes upon it, as we just take some time to learn of you, that uh, God, your word has this amazing way of meeting us right where we are and giving us right what we need, right when we need it. And Lord, we pray that you would show us your glory today, that you would unveil yourself a little bit more today, and that as we come near to you, as we behold you, as we, as we see you, as we draw nearer to you in relationship, that you would transform us, that you would make us more like you, that we would experience something of what uh, Moses experienced up on the mountain, that, that his face would literally shine with your presence. God, that you would change us like that, that we would shine forth your glory into this world and into uh, all of the lives of those who are around us because of our time spent with you. So God, use us, change us, transform us for your glory and for the good of others, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Today we're going to be uh, looking at Romans 15, 1 through 13 in two parts, okay? The first part is verses 1 through 6, patience develops hope. And then the second piece, 7 through 13, believing develops hope. Now the final quarter of the book of Romans, that's where we find ourselves, starting in chapter 12, it focuses on the will of God. That's where the whole thing is, is aimed at. It's, it's targeting uh, and really uh, unpacking the idea of God's will from a lot of different angles. And so here's the question, what's God's will for you? You, you ever wondered that? God, what is your will for my life. Well, here in Romans 15, the first half of it, we see that God's will is for you to have hope. Yes. God wants you to experience hope in this world. He doesn't want you to live a hopeless existence. He doesn't want you to just go through the motions. He doesn't want you to just kind of exist. You know the way that, that like cows exist? Have you ever been close enough to a cow to look in its eyes? They just are kind of there. You know, there's not really a lot going on inside there. They're just kind of existing and they just, and they go over and they eat some, eat some grass or whatever, some hay, and, and that's it. And then, you know, then you eat them later. Uh, but that's, that's really, there's not a lot going on. And, and I fear and, and I, I sense that there are a lot of people experiencing life that way. They're just kind of going through the motions. There's, there's not really drive toward anything. There's not really hope for anything. It's like I'm just kind of, I'm just going to kind of exist until I die. 
And that's not the life that God has for you and for me. In fact, Jesus even says in, in John chapter 10 that he comes to give life and that more abundantly. And part of the more abundant life is living a life filled with hope. And so hope is this, this uh, idea that's being targeted for us. And, and, and we have to understand in all of this that God's will is for us to experience hope. But this is a practical sort of application that we're looking at here in Romans 15 to the previous three quarters of the book of Romans, right? That, that we didn't get here just by starting here. We got here by going through the entirety of Romans and it details for us an explanation of who God is and who we are in him. And out of that flows these practical teachings. We've got to get who God is first. We've got to get who we are in him first. And then out of that flows the practical teachings. Here's the way I can say this. Theology must precede uh, 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 the idea of activity or all you get is dead orthodoxy. Theology must precede activity or you, all you get is dead orthodoxy. Uh, I don't want to just go through the religious motions. And I get the sense you don't want to as well. That, that you, didn't, you didn't get up early and, you know, uh, well, it's not that early because we have a later service. But, you know, you didn't, you didn't roll out of bed whenever you felt like it and whatever. Get the kids ready or, you know, drive down here, decide, oh gosh, it's cold this morning. I don't really want to do this. You didn't do that to go through the motions of dead religious orthodoxy. I hope you didn't. I hope you didn't because that doesn't do anything with you and God. God doesn't accept you more because you did the religious thing. Right? That, that's not how this works. That, that God receives you. He loves you because he's a good dad. That's why he loves you. That's why he receives you. And when that's established, that I can't do anything to make God love me more, but I also can't do anything to make God love me less. When that's established, hope flows through that. That's where hope comes and floods into our lives. So chapter 14 you know, at the beginning of this and all the way through this first part of chapter 15 address the idea of the stronger and the weaker. You see it there in verse, verse 1. We then who are strong, that idea of stronger and weaker. And, and I wish that I had established this better from the beginning, but I, I'm just going to use this moment to, to state this, that in this idea of stronger and weaker, we all have the potential uh, to be on both sides of this at any given moment, right? That you have some strengths where I have some weaknesses. But simultaneously true, I might have a strength where you have a weakness. That, that this is where we are in our relationships with people, with one another. And all Christians start again in the weak category. Right? They start again as born, or they start as born again. That's what the Bible calls uh, Christians. When you become a Christian, you recognize Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection for you. You enter into faith in Him and relationship with Him. The result is you're born again spiritually. And just like a baby is weak and needs to be taken care of, so too that's how we are. But that's not the way we're supposed to stay. We're, we are supposed to grow. We're supposed to develop. We're supposed to mature and become strong in Christ. That's the, that's the way that this is supposed to roll. So when you see stronger and weaker, don't think good and bad, or don't think, uh, you know, me, you, uh, that I'm up here and you're down there. Think, uh, think in terms of we're all growing, we're all developing, and we're all in the position of both strong and weak in some way. So let's look at this first part together. Patience develops hope, verses 1 through 6. Look back at verse 1, it says this, we then who are strong ought to bear with the scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let us let each of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification. The conversation here about strong and weak is an important one because we tend to make teams, don't we? We tend to categorize people into us and them. They're, we and they, us and them. We categorize people and what, then what we do is we put us above them. And the natural human tendency is to position ourselves above others. My strength is viewed in opposition to their weakness. That look at how good I am, look how strong I am, look at how much I can do, or whatever, and then I end up looking down on them. But, but this is flipping the idea on its head. It's not strong and weak for the, for the sake of 
categorizing and positioning ourselves into who's better. It's, we're told here, look, it says, we then who are strong ought to bear with the scruples of the weak. Now that idea of bear with, it's actually... Um, it's not the idea of an annoying putting up with somebody, right? You could read it that way, couldn't you? Oh my gosh, here comes that guy again. Uh, I just, I'm just going to bear with him, <laughs> right? Uh, it, it's not that idea. It, it's actually better understood as bear up. Instead of bear with, it's more like bear up. It's to come alongside them and help them carry it. They have a weakness. They have a problem. They have an issue. And remember, when we're talking about that in chapter 14, the, the weakness that they have is that they have this, this sensitive conscience toward things. And so they create more rules and more regulations in their lives so that they, they can kind of handle the different things that are happening in life. And, and it's weird because we would think that the person with more regulations is the strong one, right? The one that, that, that uh, is more restrictive, the one that, that doesn't do as much, that that's the strong one. But in fact, Romans 14 tells us, no, that's actually the weak one. And so when you see the strength of somebody else, that they have the freedom, this liberty in Christ, they, that they come to the, the weaker, that they have three options of what they can do. You see, the imagery is that the weaker person is trying to lift something and they're struggling under the weight. And when you see somebody like that, there's three things that you can do. You can add weight to them, right? You could say, here, it looks like that's really heavy. Let, here, you should carry this too, right? You can add weight to them. That, that's one of the things that you can do. You could also just not care. Oh man, that looks really heavy. Stinks to be you. All right, see ya, you know, and just take off. Or you could actually help them carry it. You could come alongside them and help carry the load with them. And that's the idea of bearing up, that, that you're coming alongside them. The bear with is bear up. You're coming alongside them to carry it with them. You see, when you bear with the weak, you hope for them. I'm hoping for you. I'm hoping that you can do this. I'm, I'm in your corner. I'm cheering you on. I'm, I'm making it possible for you to do more than maybe you were able to do before. Or even this, you allow them to borrow your hope. You ever had that happen? Somebody let you borrow their hope for a minute? You didn't have any left? You just, everything seemed bleak, dark, hopeless. It's just all going to fall apart. And someone else, God puts them in your life for that strategic moment where you're able to borrow their hope to get through that moment. That, that this is the idea of bearing up or bearing with, that you're, you're coming alongside them that way. David Guzik says it like this, if you're strong in comparison to your brother, then use your strength to serve your brother in Christ. Don't just use your strength to please yourself. Right? God's given you a strength for the purpose of serving them not just for serving you. Now, verse 2, bearing up looks like using your life to please them. You see that there? Let, us, let each of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification. That, that, that the, the bearing up looks like your life is being used to please them. Now, this is not the idea of being a man pleaser, that you got to go around and say, what do you like? And what do you like? And what do you, and I got to figure out what you all like. And I got to do everything that makes everyone uh, be pleased and that kind of stuff. But it's a window into the motivation of the heart. You see, there's two qualifiers that are uh, used for pleasing them. You see the first one there? It is, please his neighbor for his good. The first qualifier is for good, that you're, when you're helping somebody, so they, like somebody can't quote this verse and say, hey, you're supposed to, you're supposed to please me, so give me 50 bucks. Okay, what do you want 50 bucks for? I just want to go get really drunk. No, <laughs> right? Like, oh, but I got a verse. You got to please me. No, that it's, it's for your good. That the, the pleasing you is to serve you for your good. That, that if I'm not helping you in that way, uh, if I'm helping you sin, then it's not for your good, right? And the second idea is for, you see it there at the end of verse two, for edification. That, that's a Bible word for building up. So these are the qualifiers that you're seeking to please other people with your liberties to, to cause them good and to build their lives. It, it's kind of like this. My kids, um, every single day, without fail, ask me for sugar. Anybody else have kids like this? They, in some form, hey, can I have that drink? 
Hey, can you take me to Dutch Brothers? I want to, what, what do you want? I want a coffee. No, you don't want coffee. You want sugar. Uh, hey, can I have a donut? Hey, can I have a cookie? Hey, can I have some ice cream? Hey, can I? It's every single day they want some sugar. And they typically ask me, you know why? Because I usually say yes. Uh, and so they know I'm a pushover and they're going to get it out of me. Uh, but because I'm, I have more maturity than they do, I know it's not good for them or building for them to eat sugar all the time. So I sometimes say no or I say, ask your mom because I know she'll say no. <laughs> uh, then they usually say something like, you don't love me. And it's... Okay, we all know that's not true. It's because I love you that I'm saying no, right? That's the whole concept. It's that I'm not being very loving if I'm not, if I'm not serving you in this way for your good and for your edification. Now, look at verse 3. It says this, for, see the word for? This is showing us that there's an example being uh, given to us or a reason. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. Jesus is pointed to as the reason. He's pointed to as the example. And he's pointed to as the power to actually bear others up. We're not just told what to do. We're shown, uh, uh, we're, we're shown what to do in him. It's not just, just do this, but look, here's Jesus. Here's how this actually practically plays out. Because Jesus didn't position himself above others to look down on them, even though he alone is the one who rightly could, right? It's God in flesh. Jesus could come and say, all of you bow before me and worship me. And yet, instead, what did Jesus do? He took the form of a servant. He, he put on a towel and cleaned the feet of his disciples. Jesus found the, the people who were uh, the cast-offs of society and, and he went to them and brought grace to them. He looked at those who were broken physically and spiritually and emotionally and mentally and he brought healing to their lives. You see, Jesus didn't do this to other people, so his people can't treat others like that either. Philippians 2, 3 through 5 says it like this, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. You see, this is, it's saying that this attitude that was in Jesus, when you are his people, when you have faith in Jesus, when he has changed your life by, by redeeming you, by purchasing you from sin and death, then you actually start to show his characteristics. You start to look like Jesus. Now notice it says there in verse 3, as it is written. You see, this truth of the selfless service of Jesus was prophesied about him throughout the Old Testament. And, and it actually, in this, is revealing God's character. Here in verse 3, uh, it's a quote of Psalm 69, talking about who Jesus is and that, uh, that Jesus actually took the reproaches uh, of God. That when, when Jesus was reviled against, it was because people were rejecting God because they were against him. Now, it's more than just specific prophecies about Jesus, but literally everything in the Old Testament is written about Jesus. Look at verse 4. For whatever things were written before. What do you think that means? That means your Old Testament, right? Whatever things were written before. That means the Old Testament um, were written for our learning that through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. We might have hope. You see, there's more than just specific prophecies about Jesus, but everything in the Old Testament is written so that we can clearly see the glory and the character and the nature of God. That's the whole point of the Old Testament. It's not just old stories for the sake of old stories. It's not fables like Greek lore or, uh, or anything like that or Norse mythology, but it's actually displaying the character and nature of God. The heroes and the victories in the Old Testament, when you read about Abraham and David and Elijah and Daniel, they are actually Jesus' victories. They're actually pointing to the goodness and glory of Jesus. It's, Abraham's story is not about Abraham. It's about Jesus. 
Abraham's not the story, or the hero of the story. Jesus is. Daniel isn't the, the hero of the story. Jesus is. And the villains and the defeats of the Old Testament are a contrast to what happens when you abandon Jesus. They show you what it's like when you reject Jesus. You see, when we see Jesus as the hero of the story, it fills our hearts with hope. Why? Because if we look at Abraham and we say, man, what a great and awesome guy. Isn't Abraham so cool? Go look at what God did. God walked with him. God met with him. God spoke to him. God did miraculous things for him. Abraham is just another level kind of person. There's no hope in that. Because then I think, well, God would never treat me that way. I'm not as good as Abraham. I'm not as awesome as Abraham is. But when we see that it's the, the hero of the story isn't Abraham, it's Jesus. Then we realize that hope floods our hearts. Why? Because our God is mighty to save and I need to be rescued. And if he did it for him, he'll do it for me. Amen. Amen. God is so good to reach in and to save us. Look at verse 5. It says this, now, may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another, according to Christ Jesus, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice these two words, patience and comfort. You see it there in verse 5? Those words are also used in verse 4. The exact same, same thing is taking place here. But in verse 4, it's the patience and comfort of the scriptures. Notice in uh, verse 5, it's the God of patience and comfort. You see, the idea of patience and comfort of the scriptures, it's not like a spell book. You know, you like you open it up and you go, okay, I'm looking for the incantation. I'm looking for the right phrases. I gotta, you know, just, uh, where's the verb? Okay, I'm just gonna say this and it's gonna fix all of the things. That, that's just not the way that it works. Or I don't know if you're a movie person or not, but there's this movie called The Book of Eli and it's about this guy that's like trying to transport the Bible or something and then he like quotes it and this guy's trying to use it to control people because they think of it as like this magic spell book. That, that's the way the world sees the Bible. That's not what it is. Like having a Bible sitting on your coffee table doesn't bless your house. That's, that's not what it does, okay? It, you have to open it <laughs> to get blessed, okay? And you read it, not just to read the words, but to know the God. We don't worship a book. We worship the God of the Bible, and we know him. Why? Because he wrote a letter and we want to read it. And we want to know more about him. It's not a spell book, uh, but it's actually revelation of God. That's why verse 5 says, the God of patience and comfort. It's revelation of who he is. Now Jesus did it, so you should do it too. That concept, that idea. Jesus did it, so you should do it too. It's true, right? Like we want to use, we want to have Jesus as our example. And it resonates with us to some degree. But here's the problem with it. It's law. Jesus did it, so you should do it. Jesus was loving, you should be loving. Jesus served others, you should serve others. Jesus was kind, you should be kind. Jesus took a stand in the, the face of injustice. You should take a stand in the face of injustice. The, these, are, these are concepts that sort of ring true to us, but it's law. And in, in being law, there's no hope to actually be able to do it. Just because you can recognize it as true doesn't mean there's any hope in it. Does that make sense? There's no hope in the idea of trying to use Jesus as an example. We need something more than that. Look at verse 5. He says this, Now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded. The, the God is the one who puts this in you. He gives it to you. The desire to be like Jesus is a good one, but how you do it matters. Are, are you relying on your failed attempts of the flesh? You're just trying really hard. I'm just, okay, I need another run at it. All right, God, just give me another chance. Just, uh, I'll, I'll be nice next time. I'll, I'll let them cut me off in traffic next time. I, I won't buy the Snickers next time. I'll, I'll deny it and I'll get a broccoli instead or I'll, you know, whatever it is. I'll be nice to my wife when I get home from work and I won't yell at the kids and I won't kick the cat. I mean, maybe you'll kick the cat, but I'm just kidding. <laughs> the cat people are like, I'm going to stab you. Um, no, there's, it's not that we need another run at it, right? Uh, another run at it being an evil person doesn't, it, all it's going to do is produce the same thing. That's insanity, isn't it? Doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. No, no, no. We need to be transformed as different people. God, I need you to make me love cats. 
<laughs> I need you to put within me the love that I don't have. One of the things that, especially when I was, uh, when we were in the middle of planting this church and I was uh, working another job, one of the things that I did every single day on the way home from work uh, was I asked God to fill me with his spirit and to allow me to love and serve my family when I got home. Because my tendency was to get home and just check out. My tendency was just to, to say, you know what, I'm just, uh, I'm just tired. I, I've had all this stress. I got all this stuff going on. But the truth is, my job was about to start. I didn't get off work to go home and sit there like a slug. I, I got off work to go do my real job. I did all that stuff all day long so I could get home and love and serve my family uh, and be present with them. You see, is it a failed attempt of the flesh that you're just trying to do on your own? Or is it a work of the Spirit? Is God putting it within you? God has designed his word to be one of the tools that builds his character into his people. That's why God's word is being established here, right? That it's through the patience and comfort of the scriptures that you get the patience and comfort of God. That his word is one of the major tools he used to build his character into people. And his character in his people, you know what that produces? Unity. That's what he's talking about there in verse 6. That you may with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That, that when God's character is in God's people, it produces unity. And the unity that's born in us is born out of being like Jesus. See that there at the end of verse 6? Um, uh, oh, excuse me, I'm sorry. Uh, at the end of verse 5. According to Christ Jesus. It's a unity that's according to Jesus. Being, uh, th this unity is to, to, to be like Jesus and to treat one another the way that Jesus treats us in serving one another. Here's how Skip Heitzig says it. You and I are never more like Satan than when we live to serve ourselves. It is the easiest thing in the world. The default position of a human being is to serve yourself. But we are never more like Jesus than when we serve others. It's not a, just a, that's like a gut punch, isn't it? You know why? Because I love me some me. I'm always on my mind. You know what the first thing is in my mind when I wake up? Me. Something about me. I'm thirsty, I'm hungry, I gotta go to the bathroom, something. I am on my mind. And I'm on my mind all day, every single day. But when we think about somebody else, it's Christ-likeness that, that overpowers our selfishness to allow us to love and serve other people. You see, unity in Christ bridges the gap between the strong and the weak. So there's no longer a distinction or a division, but an opportunity for service. That when I see my strength and your weakness, I don't say, wow, you're such a weakling. No, instead I say, there's a chance for me to serve you. There's a chance for me to help you. It's, it's so, sort of like, the, here's an example. Uh, in this building, in this facility, uh, a group of us spent uh, about a week installing a whole bunch of new technology into this building. Um, and, uh, you know, it's one of those things that's just very, you know, it took, it took a lot of time. Uh, and, and, uh, and, you know, we put a bunch of technology into the room, but it's newer, right? And so as we updated this technology, there's actually a team, of, uh, a team that shows up early on Sunday mornings to help serve the older congregation that meets here before us, uh, Henderson Community, uh, because they, they had old stuff and they don't know how to use the new stuff. And so there's a team that shows up to serve them to make sure everything's running well, to make sure that everything's working properly, make sure there's no issues. If they need something, you know, another microphone or something set up, then we do that for them. We don't look at them and say, gosh, why don't you know how to use this board? Just, can you just get on YouTube and watch some videos, please? <laughs> you could have that attitude, right? Just figure it out. But then I'm adding weight to their weight, am, am I not? I'm not, care, I'm not loving and serving them. But I can say, you know what, I understand it. I have a strength, so I'll come help you. I'll do it for you instead. Uh, and then that way, there's time for them to learn and to grow, to train them to use it. You see, being conformed into Jesus' image produces his patience. And that develops hope. When you're conformed into his image, it produces his patience. And that develops hope. Hope that we will be more like him and also hope that they will be more like him too. All right, secondly, not only patience develops hope, but also believing develops hope in verses 7 through 13. 
Verse 7, therefore receive one another just as Christ also received us to the glory of God. You see, hope in the work of Jesus empowers us to join in that work to the glory of God and the good of others. You see, the work that we are called to is the work of receiving others. And it is work. It's work to receive people. It's work to, to, to allow people in, to be vulnerable, to, to bear with, like we're told there in verse 15, bear with their scruples, their weaknesses, to bear with the weaknesses of the weak. That's hard. It's work that's involved with doing that. But Jesus receiving me is how I am to receive others. How did, let me ask you this. How did Jesus receive you? Did he wait? Did he say, you know what? I'm going to wait till you're perfect and then, and then I'll, I'll receive you. You just figure this issue out in your life and then you come to me and then maybe we'll see. That's not the way Jesus works, is it? Not at all. Jesus takes you just like you are. You, you, can't, you literally can't change yourself to, to get into the position where he will receive you. He takes you just as you are. He, he receives you in your imperfection. He receives you immature. He receives you self-centered. But Jesus also receives you in repentance. And he receives you in faith, right? That as you come to him in repentance and in faith, he receives you. Jesus loves you enough to take you just as you are. But he loves you way too much to leave you that way. He's going to change you. He's going to transform you. He's going to push on things and say, not that. That can't be in your life any longer. We've got to change that. Now notice there in verse 7, the idea of one another. See that there? This is specific to Christians. Receiving one another is specific to Christianity. That, that it has to be people who are in the faith. And that matters a lot because we would receive Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses and Muslims very, very differently. Now, that, that does, it's not to say that Mormons can't show up to church. That's totally fine. But they're not in Christ. They're, they're, not, a, they're not saved. They're not a believer in, in the Jesus of the Bible. They believe in a Jesus, but he's not real. Uh, it's not the Jesus of the Bible. And so because of that, you don't receive them the same way. I'm never going to have a Mormon preach on a Sunday, right? Because they don't believe the same thing. There's, there's a very big difference in what's being believed. And so, yes, there's a receiving, but it's a different kind of a receiving. This kind of receiving is to say, we're one. We're united. We're part of the same family. We're part of the same body. That's this, this, this unity that's being established here. You don't receive non-believers the same way that you receive believers because they're just not part of the family yet. You don't reject them and treat them like they have the plague. No, you bring them in and you pray, God, would you bring them into your family? as well. You bring him to your dad because you got such a good dad. You're like, hey, my dad adopted me and uh, he wants to adopt more kids. Would you like to be adopted as well? That's the message of the gospel. You see, his receiving me gives me the proximity to him, the time with him, and the space near him to be able to mature and to grow. And this is how we receive others. But, but here's the thing, development, it's a slow process. It's, it's a slow thing. Growing, maturing, and developing is a slow process. Thanksgiving is coming up. And one of my, my absolute favorite, actually, we're going to do this uh, uh, at Life Group. Here's a plug for Life Group. Actually, Life Groups are about to end. So here's a plug for when they start up again. If you're not in a Life Group, you want to be in a Life Group. Our Tuesday Life Group, I'm smoking a turkey for our Tuesday Life Group. Uh, this, this, yeah, praise the Lord. And it's going to be glorious. If you've never had smoked turkey, it will change your life. It'll change your life. <laughs> so we're going to do a smoked turkey. But here's the thing. You know how long it, you know what, what it takes? How long it takes to do a smoked turkey? Like 10, 12 hours? It takes a long time. Now, I could go down and get a hungry man microwave turkey dinner and pop that thing in and be done in three minutes, right? Which one do you think is going to be a little better? Not a little better, a lot better, right? <laughs> And it's not just turkey. I mean, you get your mashed potatoes, you get the, the weird yucky green bean stuff and all that in the Hungry Man. So, so development takes time. The, the things that are worth it take more time. It's a slow cooking process to grow in the Lord. And the key is to start with a turkey though, right? I can't start with a basketball, even though it's about the same size, put that in the smoker and think I'm going to get something good out of it. You got to start with the right thing. So too it is with unity. You've got to start with being in Christ, 
You can't just say, well, I'm just going to, I'm just going to really, you know, culture, cultivate this relationship and, and it'll grow and develop and be really good in the future. No, it won't because you've got to be in Christ in order for this relationship to grow and to mature. Look at verse 8. It says this, now I say that Jesus Christ has become a servant to the circumcision and for the truth of God to confirm the promises made to the fathers and that the Gentiles may glorify God for his mercy. You see, Jesus takes the position of the servant to the Jews by fulfilling the Old Testament, but also to the Gentiles by extending salvation to them as well. This whole thing is that it's not just some people It's all people. Jesus is a Jewish man in a Jewish country, born to a Jewish family, come to fulfill Jewish scripture in order to uh, uh, unveil the Jewish God. And he does that to the Gentiles as well. And Gentiles just means not Jew. It just means everybody else who's not Jewish. You see, um, the, the, it is the others-centered serving mentality of Jesus that opens the door of salvation to anyone who, be, who would believe. This gives not just the Jews hope, this gives all people hope. Even to us today, because I'm not Jewish, but man, I gotta, I, I've been saved by this Jewish God who has loved me enough to call me as part of his people. You see, Jesus is the hero And we are all being called to do more than just stand in awe of him. God is glorified when we believe him and imitate him. That's what verse 7, the end of verse 7 is talking about. You see that, uh, uh, receive one another just as Christ received us to the glory of God. That God is glorified when we believe him and when we imitate him. Uh, When I was in high school, I really loved, you can probably tell I loved basketball by the fact that I wear basketball shoes all the time, Uh, but uh, I loved basketball. It was, it was the thing that I was just, it was my God. Uh, Honestly, if I was to, you know, really talk about that. But as a freshman, uh, I remember one time we were on this this, uh, we were traveling to go play this other team, uh, and the game got delayed for whatever reason, so we decided to go play a pickup game out on the, the playground uh, at the school there. So we're playing this pickup game, and there was this fast break, and I started running uh, down toward our, our side of the court, and one of my teammates threw me the ball. I, I think I dribbled once, maybe twice, took two steps, and did like a, a Michael Jordan from the free throw line floating through the air kind of a dunk. And all of my, all of my uh, teammates, uh, you know, were like, whoa, you look just like Jordan. That was amazing. The only difference was it was a nine-foot rim. So uh, I, had a lot, I had a pretty big advantage. It was a whole foot lower than it's supposed to be. Uh, and so I had a pretty big a- advantage. You see, you know, I'd, I'd watched a lot of Jordan, and he was my, my favorite player. And I mean, because he's the best of all time. But, you know, beside that, uh, he, there's just this uh, uh, amazing thing there. And so I wanted to be like Jordan. That was just my, my thing. Uh, I was, you know, a 5'10 white kid, but I still wanted to be like Jordan. And so, uh, you know, I was, I was constantly trying to, to be like him. David Guzik says this, if you want to perform like your hero in the game, uh, or you want to perform like your hero in the game, but you can't perform like your hero in the game unless you live like your hero in daily life. You know, it's like, like comparing that to, to the idea of me and Jordan. I hadn't played near, near, nearly enough uh, uh, time on the basketball court as he did. I didn't put nearly enough time in working on ball handling and shooting or defense. And I had the advantage of a shorter rim. Uh, and I wanted to be like him. You see, the key to being able to imitate Jesus, the hero, is daily submitting to the Father like Jesus did. Remember Jesus said, I don't do anything except what I see the Father doing? But I, I don't, I don't, I'm not here for my own will. I'm here for the will of the Father. You see, being able to imitate Jesus in our lives isn't like I just want to have that one moment on the court that's like, oh, look at that shining moment. The, you know, when I played basketball for the, the team, I sat on the bench, right? I wasn't playing all the time. Uh, Jesus uh, is the hero and I want to imitate my hero. But the way that that's going to happen is by the daily submitting to the Father. It's not trying harder that gets you to be more like Jesus. It's submitting more that gets you to be more like Jesus. Now, verses 9 through 12, it says this. Let's read that. It says, uh, the end of verse 9, As it is written, 
For this reason I will confess you among the Gentiles and sing your name. And again he says, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Laud him, all you peoples. And again Isaiah says, There shall be a root of Jesse, and he shall rise to reign over the Gentiles. In him the Gentiles shall hope. The idea of unity coming through Jesus, it's not a New Testament concept. This isn't something that Paul is just springing on us. Hey, all people are supposed to have unity in Jesus, Jew and Gentile. It's something that's always been God's plan. All the way from Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 verse 3 when he told Abraham, in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. That sounds like everybody, right? That doesn't sound like all the families of the Jewish people will be blessed. No, it's everybody is in the world is going to be blessed through this. And that's a foreshadowing and a prophecy of uh, of Jesus. Now God's mercy in verse 9 is extended beyond the Jews to the Gentiles as well. And so Paul quotes 2 Samuel 22, Psalm 18, Deuteronomy 32, Psalm 117, and Isaiah 11 to show that this is not a fluke or a vague possibility that he's trying to just throw this in there. No, this has always been God's plan. It's clearly been God's plan. This is just the way that God has always thought about this. It's not that God wanted to save the Jews just for the Jews. He wanted to save the Jews to get to the Gentiles, to everybody else. Here's the way that we apply that to us. God didn't save you just for you. You know anybody who's not saved? You got any neighbors? You got any friends? You got any co-workers? You got any, you got any family members? You got anybody in your life that's not saved? What if God wants to use you to bring the gospel to them? What if you're the way that he's trying to shine his light into this world? What if there's somebody else he wants to bring into his family and he doesn't want to use me to do it? He doesn't want to use this, this setting to do it. He doesn't, want to, he doesn't want to have them come to a church and hear a message. He wants to use you. He wants you to go and show his love and his kindness and his grace. He wants you to serve them and bear with them and to bear them up that you might have an opportunity to actually say the name of Jesus to them. What if that? And everything else. And bring them to church and all that. Right? Right? But what if God wants to use us for more than just us? What if he's reaching out to somebody else? Ephesians 2.14 says this, For Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people. When in his own body on the cross, he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. You have the same ministry of reconciliation. You have the same opportunity to break down the wall of hostility that's eating the hope in our culture. And it's the message of the gospel of Jesus. It's his death. It's his burial. It's his resurrection that produces all this. Now look at verse 13 as we close. It says this, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, the hope we need is found in God and in God alone. Because he's the God of hope. Do you see it there in verse 13? He's the God of hope. Hope isn't this thing that's out there. It's something that's part of who God is. And he gives it to you. It's a gift of God. It's something that he gives to his people. He's the source. And he's the dispenser of hope. And joy. And peace. You see the hope that you desperately need. Is access through. Look at verse 13. It's access through believing. You see that there? in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Spirit. You see, you believe in Jesus and his sacrifice for you, and that's what gets you into the hope. It's, a, it's access through believing, but it's more than you need. See how it abounds? That you may abound in hope. This is like overflowing. It's like, you know, when, when you give your toddler the milk jug and they're going to pour themselves a glass and how much of it gets in the glass? Not much, because it's abounding, right? It's, it's going everywhere. It's the bounding hope of God. It's going all over the place. And it's empowered by, notice there in verse 13, the Holy Spirit. It's by the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, he wants to fill you in verse 13. See it there, the idea that may the God of hope fill you with joy, peace, and believing, and believing. The, the, the idea that he wants to fill you, that you'll be filled with joy, you'll be filled with peace, you'll be filled with hope. Here's the thing. It's to the degree that you're filled with the Holy Spirit. See the connection there in verse 13? 
Your filling up with the Holy Spirit is the degree that you're going to experience joy and hope and peace. Those are connected concepts. So here's the question I want to ask. Is there room? Are you, are, are you just too full? Are you too full of your own things? Too full of your own life? Too full of your own desires? Too full of your own stuff for there to be room for the Holy Spirit? Uh, just to wrap it up, we experience hopelessness for three major reasons. Three major reasons. Number one, selfishness. Isn't that what we looked at in verses one through three? That if I'm absorbed with me and I'm not concerned with them, it's going to rob you of hope. Number two, rebellion. That's what we looked at in verses four through six. E either I don't know or I won't submit to God's word. And because I'm in rebellion to God and his word, it steals my hope. And number three, I'm burdened. I'm too full of other things to have room for the Holy Spirit. And because I've overburdened my own life and I don't have room for the things of the Lord, it steals my hope. You see, Jesus has done everything. There's nothing left for you to do. The gospel isn't do. The gospel is done. It's been done for you. Because a hope that is rightly placed is only placed in Jesus. As you know Jesus and you spend time with him in his word and in prayer, he miraculously transforms you more and more into his image. You see, when the character of God is developed in the people of God, through the word of God, it produces the hope of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity to open your word together today. And we pray that you would fill us with your spirit and you would bring joy and peace, and hope. God, would you overshadow us? Would you, would you have your way among us and cause us to be a people who don't just know about you or spend time sort of in proximity to you, but that we draw near to you and are made more in your image. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.